let's add realism to population growth here. Um, again, as I say, exponential growth cannot go on forever, even when populations experience some exponential growth. So here we're going to introduce the idea of carrying capacity, which is a, a limitation, a restriction, a constraint on population growth. And uh, we're going to look at what influences it, how carrying capacity emerges, as well as some ways that it can be modified um, uh, be, because of population size effects on birth and death rates. These are called OLE effects. So first off, um, a little bit of history. Uh, sometimes this is referred to Malthusian growth. Mal Malthus is a philosopher um, who was active in writing about you know, 200 or so years ago. I can't remember when uh, this uh, essay was, was published. Um, but Malthus was pointing out that uh, exponential growth couldn't go on forever. It was mostly focused on human populations. And he anticipated the pain and suffering that would come from unconstrained growth. Sometimes, like I say, you'll hear about Malthus when in discussing this. Um, what happens when carrying capacity, and that's the parameter, that's going to be a parameter K in our model. What happens when this is exceeded? Well, populations crash. Um, it's not preordained that they will crash, but it does happen sometimes. The St. Matthews Island reindeer population is an example of that. Um, and what happened here in that case was that the, 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 ex, the population exceeded the, the carrying capacity so much that during the correction, the, uh, the populations actually, population of reindeer actually went uh, extinct. That's an extreme example. What typically happens with excess, uh, with, uh, when populations exceed carrying capacity is they may, uh, they may fluctuate around the carrying capacity, sometimes consuming too many resources, sometimes allowing resources to, to um, uh, uh, become reestablished, or they can even get to a uh, steady state. And then, you know, again, reindeer, the reindeer, the same Matthews Island reindeer population is an example of that. Okay, so, but what does this actually look like? Well, here's the logistic uh, equation. Um, it's got the same components as exponential growth, but it's modified by this carrying capacity parameter, this parameter K. What it does is it means that population growth starts to slow as you reach, as you approach some maximum. Um, this is idealized. Most populations don't grow like, look like this perfectly. They don't, uh, yes, they don't grow in this way, in this sort of perfect, uh, the perfect way that's implied by this. But many will emulate this, um, many populations of trees and animals will emulate this kind of change over time. Okay, so um, this assumes that population is limited by, by something. Um, the growth rate is actually exactly the same as it is in an exponential model. Um, and you can have birth and death rates in there, just like you can within a uh, exponential growth model. Uh, but what we add here, is we add this effect of crowding, you know, the effect of crowding on um, the uh, the effect of crowding within the population on on the growth rate. We can add realism, and we can add that to death rates as well. So it's basically saying that as suggesting here, implying that as a population nears its growth rate, its po its birth rate will decrease, and potentially its death rate will decrease also, thereby creating an equilibrium at some maximum carrying capacity. It's a really compelling idea. Um, again, it's limited and the same thing can happen with, with, um, with death, as I, as I mentioned here. Um, and you can write this in different ways, including the effect of crowding on, um, on death rates. It does happen, for sure. You can see that in the case of St. Uh, Matthews Island, and even you can see it in a natural stand when you have dense regeneration and uh, increased limitation of light, nutrients, or water. That will increase the death rates of individual trees, say aspen or uh, coast live oak, or min in pretty much anything you might be interested in. Okay, and I mentioned this, um, these Ali effects. This is uh, kind of an, an interesting thing that happens. It happens in uh, any population that you are interested in. This is a, um, essentially strength in numbers where the pop where birth uh, birth rates may be increased when populations are larger 
Or likewise, death rates may be decreased when populations are larger. Um, they, some of the best examples of this happen in predator-prey systems. These systems, these are muskox. They have positive muskox. Muskox have positive Lee effects, as do some um, marine mammals. Essentially, by having a larger group, they're better able to defend themselves against predators, like wolves, for example. Um, pretty cool. Uh, and then you can add this all, all in here. You can um, parameterize uh, carrying capacity in a much more direct way. You can add a Lee effects to this. Um, and it's, it's nice. It uh, integrates a lot more realism into uh, into uh, our models of population growth. Then I want to re re return to Ali effects just uh, for one point. Um, you know, I mentioned again that they they can be very beneficial for animals defending against predators, but mostly they are a serious problem. Positive Ali effects are a very serious problem for trees, and the reason is because trees do not move. So crowding um, is very problematic for trees because they cannot move away into an area where, a, say, a mother tree would be less likely to compete with offspring. If you have increased survival of local offspring, you can actually end up increasing competition for resources and thereby reduce your overall um, fitness, definitely the survival, the survival of individual trees. So uh, Ali effects um, tend to be a problem for trees, um, you, and usually uh, they overcome this by having um, some mechanism for dispersal away from the, the mother tree or actually competing strongly with offspring. Uh, here's an example. This is a, a treatment for um, root disease. That's an example where, uh, you know, when you have a lot of closely related individuals or a lot of individuals from the same species, you may be more likely to have pest and pathogen problems. This is speaking for trees, pest and pathogen problems that are specific to one host tree. So what's going on here is Adrian Poloni spraying um, a tree to protect it from a root and um, a root rot pathogen, a native root rot pathogen in the Sierra Nevada called heterobacinian. Heterobacinian tends to, this heterobacinian attacks fur and it is more severe in areas where there's a lot of fur. Here, Ali effects, anything that would positively affect the population here is a problem for these trees. And like I say, to have anything that limits that is beneficial for them. The one, ex the one exception to this is when pollen is limiting. So any trees that are open pollinated, sometimes positively effects can be helpful if they are pollen limited. Okay, and the last thing I wanna point out because it's so important to us in thinking about forests and trees is survivorship and patterns of survivorship over time. These play into constraints on growth. Like I say, you can have a very extensive establishment of um, seedlings, but very few of them survive. This is a, called the type three growth response. It means that there are many offspring, but few survive into adulthood. Furthermore, for organisms that follow this, whether it's trees or um, lots of mollusks, uh, the, uh, the adults must live a long time so that they produce many uh, progeny, many offspring. Um, but uh, the expectation there and even the, the evolutionary strategy is that they will, uh, very few of those will survive into adulthood. There are these other two example, uh, two types of survivorship, which you may know. Type one is humans. There's a tremendous investment into offspring. There's high survivorship of offspring. Um, there's just we don't have very many relatives to say a redwood or something really long lived like that. And then birds and many other organisms are these type two, they're sort of, they're in between, it's linear over time. So type three is the one that's really, um, really relevant to us. And like I said, I showed these pictures of cowrie, extensive regeneration um, that many trees are like this. They produce m m a lot of seeds, the seeds germinate, 
but very few of these survive into adulthood into these, uh, in this example, cowrie, which are these famous, fantastic um, old growth arcaria trees that are um, very, very or rare. Of course, these trees, like all old growth forests, they're rare, um, but they're just fantastic trees. This is Tani Makuta. Uh, one of the largest trees in the world. Just, you know, takes a thousands of years old. It certainly did, Tani Mahuta certainly did start as a seedling in the understory, but because of many different factors, was able to, to grow and maintain itself within the, this um, forest uh, for thousands of years. And in the process has produced many, many more seeds than have actually been established in the overstory.